let's get on to Javois. Uh, cobalt in Idaho. Cobalt going to be very popular for the battery me- battery metals revolution for NCM batteries. JD, yeah. this is uh, this has challenged your research, hasn't it? This is uh, there's shit going everywhere with uh, Javois. So exactly, take it's us into your by, web of knowledge. By no means as straightforward a story as CMM and. I'm sure we could actually get Trav to argue your point on how big a role Cobalt is going to play going forward. We saw just uh, last week, I think Apple came out saying by 2025, they only want to use recycled Cobalt. So it'll be interesting how that plays out, but that's a little side note to what the company has come out with Mm, today. I didn't know that. So Jevoy came out today with a, a new mineral resource estimate for their Idaho Cobalt operation, like you mentioned. They've done 10,000 metres of drilling. It extends the mine life there. But um, I think the the main story with this one is why has the company's share price dropped from about a buck roughly a year or so ago to I think it's trading at about 10 cents now. 10 so cents tonight, yep. I'd say that's a combination of the falling cobalt price as well as construction cost inflation. And that has flow on effects uh, on a range of different issues for the company. So they've got debt repayments. They've got other bills to pay, obviously, contractors constructing the mine there, falling revenue from the ref- uh, their refinery facility in Finland, as well as a healthy whack of equity dilution. They raised 200 million bucks about half a year ago now. So I'll quickly touch on their Idaho Cobalt operation, some on-market transactions we've seen that sort of caught my eye, as well as the S&P refinery that they acquired a few years ago in Brazil. So like we sort of said, the construction is now on halt at the Idaho Cobalt operation that was announced earlier this year. That's on the back of low cobalt prices and construction cost inflation. They look like they're going to receive 15 million US dollars from the Department of Defense in America. So that's that's a bit of a free kick and that'll help them keep that mine on care and maintenance. I think they're going to keep about 30 people there just to keep that ticking over. So the way I sort of look at that asset at the moment, it's a bit of an option on cobalt prices so in future if we do see cobalt prices tick up i think the company sort of flagged or perhaps analysts have flagged at a price of over 20 dollars a pound then they could flick that back on with a bit more uh, capital expenditure and start to get a bit of cash flow from it getting on to the on-market transactions so i think we'd flagged last week that there'd been some interesting uh an interesting amount of volume traded in the stock. I think it was over 40 or 50% of shares on issue had traded in the space of a week or two. So it turns out that Mercuria, the fifth or fourth largest commodity trader in the world, who made their name mainly in the oil space, but like a lot of those commodity traders are transitioning to base metals and battery metals, they've increased their stake to 8.8%. So it's a kind of interesting sort of thought exercise to think what what are Mercury uh, sort of going at? They don't have the same track record as Glencore in operating base metal mines. So I don't think that that would be something in their interest. They are in the business of operating refineries and so on. They might not like Glencore have such a, uh, a long track record in this, but it's some it's a space we can sort of see them going into in the future. And just to wrap on... The transactions we've seen, Perpetual, the fund manager, has been a seller of stock, but we have seen three directors buying post the announcement of putting the Idaho operation on hold. So always good to see directors come in and pick up some stock. Lastly, we'll get on to the SMP refinery. So that's the Sao Miguel Paulista refinery in Brazil. So they bought this a couple of years ago for $22.5 million US dollars. And the final tranche of that, about 7 million US bucks, is due at the end of this quarter. They also paid down 45 million US in a debt facility that Mercuria supplied them with. So that leaves cash of about 52 million. They've also issued bonds a few years back, which are due in 2026, of US $100 million. And the company said they're still in compliance with all the covenants here. But I don't think that's something they'll want to test. And they're also paying 12.5% on those bonds biannually. So that's that's a fair bit of cash that they're having to pay out for that each each six months. The company has flagged that this will cost 65 million US dollars. Now, given I just said their cash position was 52 million, 
I think it would be a fair assumption that when the quarterly report comes out and the, they have the chat with investors next week, that this might be put on hold for a little while until they can either secure more funding or perhaps quite a wait quite a while to see what happens with the Idaho operations. So, yeah, just to recap on all of that, by no means a, a simple business, quite complicated to get your head around what they've got in Brazil, in America. We haven't even really touched on the operations in Finland there. But, yeah, the company's not in a great spot at the minute and it'll be interesting to see what the management comes and says to shareholders in a week's time at the quarterly. So these cobalt demand, trap, you've got, you've got some info. Oh. The, the common punter like myself is not aware of because uh, you automatically think, oh, NMC batteries, cobalt, going to need shitloads of it for batteries, but it may is not the case. What's my, the my expertise to the extent I have any is is looking at companies, not commodities. But um, well, I, when I think about like cobalt from a supply demand perspective, well, like you know, on 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 the demand side, I can't, it can't, I can't possibly un, like every single. EV engineering manufacturer in the world is is trying to figure out how they can engineer out of, out cobalt out of the lithium ion batteries that need to go into these things because it it, it is uh, you know a, a crazy proposition that they would be so reliant on a commodity that comes pretty much exclusively from the DRC. So you know on the on the demand side, I think there's just a big risk that you know the the fundamental driver of demand growth for this um, gets engineered out. Um, and then on the on the supply side, if you if you buy the the copper bull thesis that all of these new copper mines have to come online in order to satisfy the demand for EVs, has anyone done the math on on what the byproduct cobalt production will actually be from all those new copper mines? Given the fact that a lot of these undeveloped copper projects are copper cobalt with a you know there's cobalt with a byproduct there. So so I'm just. I think the fundamentals aren't as compelling as they, they would be for other battery metals, but that's that's just my take. So you said most of it comes out of DRC, so that's the Kamoa Kakula project. That's Ivanhoe and Zijin Mine. Gee, Zijin are in everything. AVZ, Porga, God, they're involved in everything. Uh, so that's one of the big ones. Who are the other players in the cobalt scene? Glencore have a big presence in the Congo as well, and like – Trav hit the note really well there. This is a byproduct. So if you look at all the the copper miners throughout the um, the copper belt in Africa, they they produce a lot of this stuff. Um, it often comes in nickel mines as well. So if you look in Indonesia and see who the the nickel laterite producers are, they'll be producing a fair bit of cobalt as well. So I'm sure China, um, molybdenum, CMOC uh, produce a lot of cobalt as well. So, yeah, it just doesn't respond the same way that dem demand supply reaction with cobalt is not as simple as Economics 101 would sort of tell you. Yeah. And just one, just one more point to add on to voir. I do have a bit of a gripe to pick in the way that, you know, this company reports. There we go. Yeah, yeah we had to have one today. We <laughs> can't walk away black <laughs> feeling, leaving the listeners feeling good. Uh, my gripe is in relation to the, the way that they report their EBITDA. And there's, they always report this, you know, beautiful looking EBITDA margin, even though they lose cash. And they do that because the EBITDA margin they report is this adjusted EBITDA margin. And what are they adjusting for? It's, a, it's an inventory build-up adjustment. And it like to me, that stuff is just... A bit strange because when when you have um, a commodity like cobalt and there's an inventory build up, the reason you're building up inventory is because the prices are lower and you don't want to um, sell them at that lower price because you kind of make prices go even lower by doing that. And so it, you you do your mark to market on that inventory at a price that you realistically couldn't get for that inventory. Um, so I just I, I just don't I don't think it's fair for commodities like you know. Um, for, for like cobalt and mineral sands to be adjusting your EBITDA margin for these inventory build-ups. There you go. Note to producers out there. Take some advice from Trap. We'll improve your day. <laughs> 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 <laughs>